Ah, today we're going to talk about edges. It's going to be a very edgy conversation. There's lots of different things you can do to the edge of a paper, and many of them are for fun. Others are to make you feel satisfied. How many times have you said, oh, that feels so satisfying to do that? You hear me say that all the time. Some of them are to make a project. You may have already done this, or maybe you haven't. You can fold a piece of paper into a book very simple. You want to make sure the edges, the points of the paper meet. And a tool that you can use to make these edges nice and sharp is called a bone folder. Not all of them are made out of bone, but they all look pretty similar to this. and it makes a little book. Notice that the pages get folded back and forth. So when you do the back and forth of your folds, it makes things more flexible. Isn't that great? Look at that. I love this. And I've used this to make several projects. This is a small book made out of one sheet of paper. I made it out of a digital that I made. There's a small picture of the entire digital. And then I folded it like I showed you, inked all the edges and made it into a tiny, what I call affirmation book with affirmations, pictures, words, little pocket with a place to write. And I made an envelope out of a double-sided piece of paper. So you could do this when you are doing origami type things. You can print your paper on both sides and then the little book goes in the envelope. So bone folder for folding. So this is an envelope punch board, very handy tool to have. It gives you directions and it shows you a picture. There's a little bit of a learning curve, but once you mess up once, you pretty much know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes with its own little bone folder. If you need both, you can get your bone folder with your envelope maker. Here is a paper trimmer. It also comes with a scoring blade. When you put a piece of paper in there, you can use this to score. There you go. If you don't have the scoring blade, you can still do it with your bone folder. Just put your paper in here and run your bone folder down that little trough and you can get a nice neat fold as well. This is called a score board. Usually they come with a bone folder, this one did. So with this one, you can score and it gives you measurements. Again, you're gonna use your bone folder or if you don't have that, you can always use a stylus and score. People say, should you fold this way or should you fold this way? I like to fold it that way, but I don't think it matters. And if you are really confused, just turn it over and score it again. And then you've got a score that's gonna make it very flexible. This is a really good tool to have. It's an investment, but it's so great when you're making projects and you have to flip things around and you have to score several places. The art of paper folding is called origami. And there's lots of different people on YouTube that do origami. The trick with origami is that you need to really have a design on both sides of your paper so that when you fold it, it's pretty. I did some jelly plate prints with my grandkids and folded one into a little box for uh, my granddaughter's birthday gift. And I think the box was something that her friends liked a lot more than the bracelet that was inside. So there's all kinds of folding. You can use it in journals to make special papers pages by folding things in a certain way. In my hidden art journal, there's a lot of folding going on. You can make little books by just folding a few pieces of paper and sewing down the middle. This is a folded pocket made from book pages here again. Folded book pages. These are folded into little ribbons. This book page is folded into a pocket that holds a tag. This is a junk journal that I made and I want you to notice the zigzag around the edge. I punched the corners with a corner rounder. The stitching helps hold it together and make it sturdy. Back here, I've folded a corner and made it into a pocket. More corners and pockets made out of book pages folded and this edge is done with a piece of lace and stitching all the way around. Here, 
This is one piece of cardstock and I folded it up. You can see the other side here. I folded it up and made it into a pocket. Folding, edges, lace and stitching and a variety of papers as well. And here is the back pocket because I did the same thing with the cover. Here's the one side of the cardstock. Here's the other side. And I folded it up when I, when I was making the cover. You can see it here, the entire piece of cardstock, zigzag stitched, nice and sturdy. I just remember, oops, oh, it's an old one. This is an old Pennsylvania map. But I remember having to try to fold the map back the way it was. That was always a challenge, but I got to be a real expert at it. You really just treat it like an accordion and then you fold it in half. What would we have done if we couldn't fold up our maps? Here's a project that I made from one of my torn magazine pages and I turned it into a lantern by folding it two ways, put a candle inside, you wouldn't want to put a lit candle inside, but you could put one of those little battery operated ones and you have a lantern. Now the thing about folding is that sometimes you can fold things so much that they end up tearing. And that's one nice thing about folding. If you don't have scissors and you fold back and forth enough, you usually can tear your paper on a nice straight line. And you can also tear paper with a ruler. This is a Tim Holtz ruler that is good for tearing and cutting. This has a metal edge in there. I've mentioned this before. So that when you're using a blade, you're not gonna cut into that plastic. But then this is a nice beveled edge and you can use that for tearing. It also has teeny tiny holes, so you can actually stick a pin through there and make a dotted line so that you can tear. So this is a really nice ruler. It's really great. It's also got a zero in the middle so that you can put the zero in the middle of your project and you know how far out from that you need to either make a mark or say I wanted to make one inch mark on each side of this. I could just put the zero at the fold and then come out an inch on either side and I've got it just where I want it on both sides. When you're folding something to do origami or make a project that's got to be perfect, I like to match the corners. I'll say I'm going to fold this way. I'm going to watch my corners and match them up and then I walk my finger to the center and go down and across. Start with your corners. Your lines should be right. Now cutting. This is my favorite paper trimmer. It has an actual wire in here right in there. I don't know if you can see that little wire. If I put it like this maybe you can see the wire here. That wire is to line up your edge of your paper instead of looking for this little track here. The wire you can see, and it's guaranteed forever. This is the thing with Fiskars. This little wire in here used to be like a piece of the wire that you hang pictures with, several pieces of wire twisted together. And I hit that wire so many times and shredded it. And I sent picture of it and they would send me a whole new arm. After that happened about four times, they sent me a whole new paper trimmer. Then. And they finally fixed the wire so it's one good sturdy wire and when they did that I've never had a problem with this. Now I've also found that when I use some very thin paper, this is a piece of parchment paper that I actually used to make a jelly plate print. When I put that in there I'm better starting in the middle of the paper than at one end. It just seems to make sure that I don't crunch up my paper. Start your blade in the center of your paper. You always use your cutting mat and a ruler and a sharp X-Acto knife or blade. And I do that for bigger pieces. I, I have my cutting mat and then I have several of these I got at Harbor Freight. They're very inexpensive. And when they're dull, you just snap off a bit of that blade. Like I said, this Tim Holtz one has a piece of metal in here. Line it up with your mat, which makes it much easier. Paper on this line. Put your ruler on that line and cut down. Here's another trimmer, and this is the big mother load trimmer. It has a handle on the back that you can put on here. It's got this thing you take out, you know, and you have this and you put this in. So yeah, it's a little bit of work to set it up. And honestly, this is not my favorite. If this is your favorite, let me know why. Give me some reasons that I should use this because I have a problem with it. Every time I go to cut something, it seems, I can't really see the edge. You know, you can measure it here, 
but I can't really see the edge. And you have to hold this down when you use it. I also think it's quite dangerous. You have to hold this down and I can measure here, but I have a hard time seeing what's underneath here. I can measure it at four here, hold it down. What happens if you don't hold it down, if you forget, you can really mess up your project. The smaller this gets, it will move on you. So I'm not a fan of this one. If you are, let me know why. Let's go on to fussy cutting paper. There's a couple of different kinds of scissors. Well, there's lots of different kinds of scissors, but these are the two that I have. I have tonic scissors, Tim Holtz in two sizes. And these are my favorite for cutting long pieces, but these are my favorite for just about everything else. And you can tell by them that they're well loved. I have never had to replace these. I can cut aluminum cans with these and then I can cut ribbon. And that's amazing. These cut through everything. I've cut thousands, thousands of aluminum cans with this one pair and I just love them so much. And of course, put a ribbon on it if you're gonna go to a friend's house or a class so that you know they're yours. I have ribbons on all my scissors. These are my old close to my heart little detail scissors and these have an edge on them that is sticky right now, an edge on them that is a uh, nonstick, like a Teflon coating. So when I do fussy cutting, fussy cutting takes very sharp scissors. And if you're doing a detailed item like this, I like to cut it out as close as I can. So I get rid of all that extra bulk. Then I watch, I watch, let me stand up to show you. I keep my eye on the outside of this black. I don't want to cut a white edge. I'm going to cut as close to that line as I can. But instead of looking at the black, I look at the white. And the reason is it just seems to work for me that I don't cut into the black that way. I watch the white, not the black. If you leave a tiny bit of edge like that, you can always go in with a marker and fix that. Now watch how I go past that little M little space in there and I go around here and for the you know just to show you and save some time I would go back and clip right up the middle and then go in and meet can you see that there's a little tiny body piece in there and I meet it halfway instead of trying to go in and maneuver all around that I come out and then I go back in and then I come out again and I cut on the other side of that little tiny body piece. Can you see it? So we get it better. And this is my favorite thing. Well, it's hard to say because I love to rip too, but I love to cut. And I thought, you know, I really need to just do a video and show you guys how I love to cut. Now I'm going to cut off those antenna just because they're just way too skinny. Now, if you were gonna leave an edge, a white edge around, you could leave them. See how there's a little white around the edge? But you can go in there from the back. If you're gonna just glue it on something, the problem with this is you've gotta be careful that your marker doesn't slip and make black marks everywhere. So that's a little tricky. Another thing you can do is take, this is black soot, distress oxide. You don't need to use Distrex Oxide, but you can just go around the edge that way or from the back and you'll get your edges black. This is gentle. Now this is black, so obviously that's easy enough. But if you have a color, and this is one of my leaves and it also has that black edge, and I can still go in there with the ink and not really worry if there's a little extra black on the ink on the leaf, it's not gonna hurt anything. And it kind of gives it more dimension could also just put this down and ink around the edges. And that looks great. It's just nice to get rid of the white edges. It just makes it look more professional. Not that we're professionals, but it just looks better. Let me put it that way. It just looks better. Okay, so let's try cutting these out with the bigger scissors. Well, I'll sit in front of the TV or sit outside with George and I'll cut. And when you use a bigger pair, and remember, I'm looking at the white, not at the purple, then you can make nice straight lines. Notice I'm not cutting with the ends of my scissors. I'm cutting way up in here. I mean, it's second nature. And if you're, you know, if you've cut a lot, you probably automatically do 
do that too. See how nice and straight with a big pair of straight shear blades. And then I can open up again. You know, instead of using my paper trimmer when I'm sitting with George or in front of the TV, I just cut by hand because I love to cut. It's like therapy. I'm never in a rush to stop cutting. So that's how you cut out these edges. And of course, again, you can just use the ink and get rid of the white edge. Beautiful. When you wanna leave a white edge, I would suggest using a pair of these scissors. Let's cut out my signature rose and leave a nice white edge. Notice I have all those little Zia lines. That's my Zentangle inspired art. That's one of the Zentangle things I've picked up along the way is just these little extra curly cues. When you cut with a white edge, it's important to have it be consistent so that it looks like you did it on purpose and in all the white around the edge of everything is the same width. So this takes a little bit of practice. This takes a little bit of care and I can cut all the way around everything and come back in and get closer if I need to later. This is very tiny. And I always like to cut off the edges. So you can see here how I left a lot of white. What I can do here is cut down the middle partially till I have that same width and then go back out. It's, it's fiddly, as they say in the UK. It's fiddly, but it looks beautiful when you finish. It's just really painstaking when they're this tiny. Well, let me show you. Okay, here's one leaf that I had cut out and we did the black around the edge, right? Well, here's another one of my leaves where I left the white edge. When you leave the white edge, there's no need for you to ink the edges because <laughs> see the two different looks you can get from the same kind of piece of art. Here's a fish fussy cut right up to the edges. Now he hasn't been done yet with the black, but I can go in there and I can do black because he is, uh, his lines around his edges are black. So you can get in there even between things like that. If you have a spongy kind of thing like this, you can get right in there and get rid of the white lines. Makes it look more finished, see? He already looks more three-dimensional just by doing that to his edges. A lot of fun cutting, but when you want a fussy cut, get the right scissors, use the right techniques. So here's a napkin. And one way to pull the napkin layers apart, if you have trouble, this is coming apart already. You can put a little bit of glue on your finger. Oh wait, glue on both fingers. And it'll help pull those apart. There you go. So when we have one layer and we want to tear it, you don't want to tear it like this because you're not going to know what shape you're going to have. There's a couple of different tools you can do this with. Grab a Q-tip and some water and wet where you want to tear. The napkins look pretty torn and I can tear this napkin right where I want to tear it. Or you can use a water brush, and this works perfectly too. Tear, tear, tear. Now there's also the conundrum people have over which way you tear something so that you don't get the white. I don't want a white edge on this side. So what I do is tear away from me. You don't get the white line. If you tear towards me, you get the white line. So that's it. If you don't want the white line, I say throw it away. That's how I look at it. Throw it away. We don't want the white edge. We're going to throw it away, which means tear away from us. And there you go. The other piece will have the white edge. There's a way of distressing, and that's when you're using, again, ink. And you, depending on how you hold your ink applicator, you get more ink if you hold it this way. If you hold it straight up, you're just going to get the edges like that. More ink, less ink more, less. can rough up your edges, which is always fun. This is a Tim Holtz distress tool, and it's just got a blade in there, and you can hold it different ways to distress your paper. But you don't really need this. Get your scissors and do the same thing. Same thing, right? Same thing. You can use a nail file to sand the edge away, or even this is close to my heart cardstock. The color is printed on it. Now, I don't know if they still do this. This is my stash from the early 90s. <laughs> you can sand away the color to distress it. So tearing is one of my favorite things. And you can see here, tearing, I have actually sanded this. 
I've glued it. I have some where the lines are there and some where the lines are not, the white edge. So many fun things you can do with paper edges. See you next time. Bye.